of writing and writing poetry. Um, I'm speaking in my capacity, my name is Bill Herbert, and I'm speaking in my capacity as incoming degree programme director on the MA in writing poetry. Uh, so the welcome is Newcastle University's welcome. It is the Newcastle Centre for the Literary Arts welcome. Um, and I'm, I'm really delighted to, to be uh, uh, bringing to you nine uh, writers this evening uh, in one form or another. Actually, I do believe um, we've got eight writers, uh, so that's nine including me. Um, but for, fortunately, you know, nine is, 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 the, is the, the kind of sacred number of muses and, uh, and, and indeed performance. So we are, we, are, we are covering the basics here. Uh, okay, so this is my favorite bit. Um, my favorite bit about teaching, um, uh, after listening to the sound of my own voice, is listening to the sound of everybody else's voice. I, I love the, 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 the poetry workshop, the writing workshop, where everyone gets together and you can just listen, not least because it's much less work for me. Now, this is the last such occasion in which we are going to get everyone together under the official aegis of their MAs, uh, respectively. And this, therefore, is the kind of the ritual incantation or recital that is going to carry them over uh, the threshold um, uh, is far more important than the degree ceremony itself. Uh, it's, it's the secret society version of the degree ceremony in which people um, are carried over the threshold back into the writing life. Unfortunately, this evening, the, the feasting that, that should accompany it company this is is largely atomized people are just uh, just sort of getting on with that by themselves but from now on and from whenever we meet each other and from whenever you meet any of the writers tonight buy them a drink you know this this is good stuff that's happening here the MAs themselves are a period of deep scrutiny uh, it's a time for you to, to, to look at yourself your art to, to, to join a creative community it's a spell apart um, in which, I mean, I think of it as a bit, a bit like a kind of a little stay on the Holy Island or for our London uh, companions, Eel Pie Island, um, where you can uh, basically join in a community of voice. And that's what I'm welcoming you to tonight, a coming together of all the different forms that people are indulging in. We've got poetry, we've got story, we've got some film, um, uh, and we are we are celebrating, a, um, I don't say so much a family, that's that's a bit kind of cutesy, isn't it? It's not, it's not a family, but it's certainly, a, it's, a, it's a community. And uh, um, we're not celebrating so much the degree itself as the society of authors that that community represents, people who become each other's audience, who become each other's critics, who become each other's editors, who support each other on that aisle of voices. So without further blather, let's invite the first reader to join us. Sue Johns is our first reader tonight. Sue originates from Cornwall, where she started performing as a punk poet back in the 1980s. She's published three pamphlets and two full, full collections. Uh, these range from Hush with Morgan's Eye Press in 2011, Rented, Poems on Prostitution and Dependency with Pale Well Press in 2018, and a new pamphlet, Track Record uh, with Dempsey and Windle in 2021. Uh, she was highly commended in the Pro competition and the Amnesty International uh, competition, and she's widely published in across the poetry magazines. So would you all welcome Sue Johns. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Um, so three poems for you. Um, I wrote a sequence of poems called The Drug Histories, <clears throat> where I reinvented famous dead people um, as if they'd taken a lot of drugs. Um, and this is Thatcher's Veins. Thatcher's Veins are as scarred as the Welsh valleys, though it's Afghanistan she remembers with fondness. White stuff, pure enough to snort. It is a cold war that drives the longest serving British junkie prime minister to score a bag of brown. Her own handbag empty apart from her works. But the lady is returning this to her advantage. 
She can boost a frozen chicken, a bottle of Chanel and a car radio and have them shifted within the hour over a blended whiskey at the bitch and grocer. But when she's on the nod, her limbs grown heavy inside her last aquascutum, drifting in and out of premiership, she mumbles her demands, cheap cider, clean needles. Oh, where have you been, Mags? You may as well ask for free school milk. A bit more serious. Um, this is the poem that got highly commended in the uh, Amnesty International competition, and it's called Barrel Bomb. In a city where sirens hush the night creatures, every morning is eaten off a knife. A widow comes to breakfast on blood and masonry, plucking my debris from the earth. The furrows of her palms are ignorant of their cargo, as are the soles of her feet. I am the penitent beggar at the heel of her broken shoe. Sister, I cry, cast me skyward. Stop this mortiferous rain. Reverse my unguided fall. Refill me with oil. Remove my bearings from the shredded limbs. Return them to industry. Take me back to scrap and pig iron. Have the furnace recast me as a bedpan or scalpel. Bring the nails from the hospital. The ones that took the eye, the nose, the tongue. Reinvent them as a trundle cot or crutches. I'll finish with a sonnet because I wrote an awful lot of them on this course. <laughs> and this one's called Safe Bet. Bloke says, cash points empty, must be Bob. I ask if Bob's in the bookies, as he's my dad. Bloke comes back. Bob says he don't know you. Then I do, though. I grew up with your mother. Bob always said he didn't know her either. Bloke goes and another comes out and says, Bob says, do you have any cigarettes? I tell him no. He says, so what do you do? I tell him I'm at college doing childcare. He farts, apologises. I hear a cheer. First bloke reappears, says, lucky lady. Rent money came in first. Your old man won. Bob says to give you 20 for the baby. Did you keep it? No. He swaps it for a 10. Thank you. There we go. Yeah, yeah. I was so busy. I was so busy clapping or mime clapping uh, that I couldn't get my own button unmuted there. The mime clap. We've all learned that one, haven't we? Uh, great. OK, well, let's move on from Sue to Sue. Um, our, our initial structure is, is basically Sue, Sue, Kit, Nisa, Emma and Aaron, John. And, and that's the mnemonic that I'm using to carry me through the evening. Uh, the next reader is Sue Reed, uh, who, who Sue came to Newcastle as a mature student having had a career teaching children with severe learning difficulties uh, up until uh, 10 years ago in 2011. She retired from teaching and ran her own business for seven years as the Wooly Peddler. Now I misread that the first time as the Wooly Peddler. Um, upcycling didn't help, upcycling <laughs> knitwear into clothing, soft furnishings, and in my mind at least, uh, woolen bicycles. Uh, she promised herself by the time that she was 60, she'd be writing for a living. And the MA at Newcastle has been pivotal in that journey. Very, very glad to hear it, Sue. Uh, she lives in rural Northumberland and blogs at the Bridge Cottage Way. She's working on her first novel for young adults called, uh, magnificently called The Rewilding of Molly McFlynn, uh, which is a coming of age story set in Northumberland during the 2020 pandemic and in Newcastle during the 1649 witchcraft trials. So would you welcome please, Sue Reed. Thank you. 
I'm going to read a section from The Rewilding of Molly McFlynn, um, which, as Bill said, is a novel for young adults um, or whoever else would like to read it or listen to it. This is chapter one, Leaving Town. We drove out of town in silence under a bruised sky. Enough had been said already. Mum's eyes were swollen, dark circles and no makeup. Hair scragged back into a bobble. She looked proper messy. I put curls in my hair before we left and had a new nail design. Black and white stripes, tune colours. I spent ages doing them last night to match my new top. Mum was wearing her usual blue jeans and pale blue jumper. You'd have thought she'd had enough of blue at work. I picked up my phone. If I was going to be sent away, then I'd need a way of keeping in touch with my friends. I started a group on WhatsApp and added Abby, Shona, Jess, Esme, Amy. What about Dom? Yeah, I added him. He was the best shopper and the best dressed out of us all, after all. Group name? The Perfectionists. First message. Hi, everyone. Waving emoji. Starting this group chat as I'm being sent away for a few days. <gasps> Horror emoji. Not for long. We'll be back in time for my birthday. Cake emoji. Can't wait. Love you all. Hearts and kisses. I snapped a selfie holding up my black and white nails. Added that filter that takes all the blemishes out of your skin and posted it to my Instagram story. I had two new followers, both from sun-tanned old men in American military uniforms looking for love and friendship. I blocked them. A few dog walkers braved the town more, heads bent against the wind. Rumour had it the hoppings might not be on this year. Even if they were, I didn't think I'd be allowed to go after Mum found out I got off with that lad on the waltzer. And now this. You could see the cows in the distance across the grass. Weird that, cows in the middle of Newcastle. Abby hates them. They're okay if you don't have a dog. We don't have any pets. Nan and granddads have got a dog, a cat, chickens and bees, if you can count bees and chickens as pets. I couldn't wait to see Meg, their border collie. It's been ages. One consolation, I suppose, for five days of boredom. It was fun going to their house when we were kids, but we've not been for years and I'm not a kid anymore. I'm not sure why we stop going. Mam changes the subject when I ask and she gets angry if I go on, so it's best left. I have kept in touch with Nan. She sends birthday and Christmas presents and likes me to write her letters. She writes back on note paper that smells like the hippie shop in town. I've got all her letters in a box I keep under my bed. I was looking forward to seeing them, just not staying there. I wanted to stay at home. Shona's mum's a nurse too and she's still going to school. The school is open for key workers. Mum said I couldn't be trusted. After all I've done for her, can't trust me. Wasn't even my idea. I blame Jess. She always has the ideas but never the guts to go through with them. Can't be trusted. I'm plenty old enough to look after myself. Been doing it for the past two years. Cook the tea, Molly. Put the washing on, Molly. Run the hoover around, Molly. I've got a life. I've got friends. We had plans. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. That's great. Now we're moving on relentlessly through the media. We, we've heard we've had poetry and novel. Now we've got a bit of film for you. This is uh, Kit Hollings. Kit can't be with us tonight, so she's delivered her text by film. Uh, Kit was born on her parents' farm in Kilmartin Glen on the west coast, uh, west coast of Scotland, and now lives in Cumbria. And, and Kit's poem in this film uh, is called Kill Martin Glen, and it's written after a visit back to the farm. Uh, she describes it as the February rain slattering down in stair rods on a walk amongst the standing stones and Bronze Age cairns of my childhood playground. 
Now, the film is rather short, uh, so I'm going to read you a little bit more about what she says there um, so that you get the kind of the, the atmosphere before we go in. I wrote it first the way I speak, though the words drukit and claggy looked startled in amongst the surrounding blander tones. I think she means English. I rewrote it using the local sounds and tones of the Glen, and it changed into something unexpected, borrowing the speech patterns of the folk I once lived amongst brought long time past back to life with forceful immediacy. It made me realize the connective power of words in a very literal way. So here's the, the short film of Kit Hollings, Kilmartin Glen. Kilmartin Glen, bent again the afternoon rain, spit in her faces like pellets of ice. We yanked the dugs, my brother and me, ruin the burial cairns. Past drooked sheep in claggy fields, where water sat like souring cream between the standing stains. On and up to the park we went, where aft we'd sprung a boot as bairns, we halters and cobbies, trying to coax our ponies doon, saddle them up and gallop off to the woods or the shore or anywhere else that took us a war for a hame. Short but exceedingly sweet uh, from Kit Hollings there. Um, now let's move on to our next reader, uh, Nisa Said, uh, who is based in North London, has been writing poetry with the Poetry School. Um, thank God those two mapped onto each other um, for over 10 years. Now that's a lovely fact in itself, the way that the school creates that, those communities, those long standing relationships between writers that go on for. Uh, a decade here. Uh, so her interests include art and film, which you can see inspiring her work. And she is working towards first pamphlet and a first collection there. Uh, so you welcome Nisa. Thank you. Um, my, my first poem is called The Agony of Flowers and it incorporates um, collage lines of poetry by Yayoi Kusama. I run through a field of flowers, bursting with crimsons and siennas, eat their petals, suck their juice. I chase them, but they overwhelm and obliterate me. I disappear in the universe like a droplet falling into water. I cut birds out of darkness, cut stars from waves of black. I paint, throw nets of moonlight into a sea of petals. Amidst the agony of flowers, the present never ends. Now the second one is um, inspired by Anish Kapoor's artwork, A Wing at the Heart of Things. Two angel wings break, fall to earth as planes of sky. Deep lapis blue, they lie discarded like butterflies, a morpho blue kissing a fruit's flesh on the forest floor. Earth becomes sky, the firmament's vault, the bed of the sea. They disappear into the earth ether, crumbling to dust. This next, next one is an erasure poem um, constructed from Adam Zagajewski's um, poem for M. Stars in, in black grass, midnight shining like a thorn, plucked from the storm's orchids. Crumpled water, easy ecstasy in the lips of noon. Hummingbirds and rifles, bloomed, so devout. The taste of light dazzles the innocent. Bitter cinnamon, dust, unshed blood. On the viaduct, dry sun. Laughter, you said, iron, salt, glass. The future, your life. This short next one is called Lily of the Valley. They bow low under the weight of modesty. Scudding clouds batter their delicate green stems. Icy winds slice through them. White bells hang perfected, hide a heart enclosed in velvet tears. 
the tears of Eve, exiled from the garden, falling to earth. And this last one is called The Violence of Roses. You wait upon God, listen to the science of birds, hang a relief of screams, face their reach, their flow. You run the reels, massacre in Arcadia, turn to dusklit roads, walk under skies of no fixed abode. The double of a kiss you keep in a jar, tilt silk skeins your glass to the light. Dust motes still as you frame their fall, mourn its fluid moments passing. Outside, the science of birds disrupts the roses you bring to the rivers of your mouth. Their compliments ends with yours. A black and white water wheel turns through a language of mirrors. After images spin through jewels of time, focus the stranger's frontier lines, their meetings in your gaze. Their negatives begin to mirror your positives. Kaleidoscope the burning of flags. They break with your vanity, millstone tears to the sound of television drones. Too high above, satellites relay through cloud. Each pillar of light passes, sleep hawks, wakes to the complicity of our joys. Soon, the collateral rosebud tears and soundless petals. You wait upon God in the science of birds, tend to the violence of roses. Thank you very much, Nisa. Great to get a bit of uh, ekphrasis in there uh, with uh, particularly Kusama, who's like absolutely marvelous, marvelous artist. And uh, you know, it was, it was just it's always fascinating to see the the angle that people take when they when when confronted by by, by such such work. Um, so thank you very much, and we will we will move smoothly on um, to Emma, uh, our next reader, Emma Simon. Um, uh, Emma's had two pamphlets published uh, previously, uh, Dragonish from the excellent Emma Press and The Odds uh, from Smith Doorstop, um, very venerable and, and honoured publisher. This year she's won two prizes. Uh, you know, nobody just wins one prize on these courses here. It's always in the brace format, isn't it? Both the York Mixed Poetry Prize and the Live Canon International uh, Poetry Prize and she's hoping that the work that she's been working on during the MA uh, is going to form part of that future first collection, as are we all. Can I welcome uh, uh, Emma Simon? Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, so I thought I'd start, Sue finished with a sonnet, but I thought I would start with one. It's called, The Heart is Not an Emoji Heart and Not the Heart of You. I'd rather have a pig's heart. They seem robust emotionally, always rootling for good stuff and loyal. At school, I weighed one in my palm. It felt strong enough, firm and muscly. And when I pushed the glass tube in to inflate a ventricle, the mechanics all worked perfectly, despite its butchered state. Not scarred, not broken. One dark clot oozing from the pulmonary vein, like a single teardrop waiting to be dabbed away before the pig gets on again with all its piggy things. The kind of heart those girls squealing on the bench behind would like. A pig's heart is valentine shaped, sits dead center in its chest, beating wildly. Not this off kilter ache, which still unbalances me. Um, and I thought I would read a couple of um, lockdown poems as we've spent uh, quite a lot of our MA in lockdown. Uh, the first one is called Dear Bees. Dear Bees, I know it's a lot to bear, these half-voiced mumblings and frets among the budding lavender. It's not as if you haven't got your own troubles to worry about. But here I go, trowel in hand, making heavy work of the weeds. I'm no longer sure if I'm digging up dandelions or anemones. Listen, the news isn't good today, but I guess you knew that. Bumbling stalk to stalk, garden to garden, to the frazzled hums of one more disappointment. 
Do we weigh down your wings with all these confessions? Secrets charging your cells like batteries, gossipy snippets stuck to your legs as you rise from the buddleia. We unburden ourselves to an afternoon sky, our little striped consciences. Look at them fly. Through the fence, I saw a woman next door kneel down by the border. The sound of her prayers drowned out by the continual loops of the lawn sprinkler. Um, and to finish is another lockdown poem. Um, we had as one of our guest tutors, Caroline Bird, um, and she talked about poems being truthful, but not containing any actual facts. So I sort of bore that in mind while I was writing this, which is kind of my response to the lockdown. It's called An Arsonist's Guide to Lockdown. There are tricks to keep yourself safe. Damp kitchen towels wrapped around the matches, drawers locked, keys stashed up on your highest shelf. Make sure you bin junk mail and newspapers. Left in piles, your itching hands will want to twist and concertina them into paper lighters. Surround yourself with a sterile whiff of stainless steel and iron, filing cabinets, cutlery, heavy duty grills, the unburnable that's dragged out, blackened, warped, yet still intact when everything you've loved has gone. Don't think about the giddiness as the quick flames of the kindling catch the warm glow from deep inside as a strut or joist takes hold. Forget that sense of abandon, watching a disused shed slowly collapse in on itself. You've tried to keep yourself in check before, but it seemed to matter less when the world was out there to rampage in and other people just collateral damage. Who hasn't had relationships like that? But now your fire stoked demons are all curling inwards and you're scared to breathe too hard. Concentrate instead on the steady rain outside. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. There are, that's, um, it's uh, of course a feature of this, uh, of this uh, degree that, that you've had that kind of redoubled interiority of both self-reflection and lockdown, so the, and so it's interesting to see the, the the literature that is emerging from that from that period. Uh, uh, our next reader here is Anne Simons, um, uh, who after a, a, another uh, returning to writing, I think uh, here after a career teaching deaf children and adults, Anne, Anne began writing poetry in retirement, and her work has been published widely, uh, unalphabetically here, Anne, I'm going to try and just do a bit of live reordering. Uh, agenda, fantastic. Um, uh, ink, sweat and tears, no, ekphrastic review, uh, summing up that, uh, that ekphrastic theme again, ekphrastic review, ink, sweat and tears, um, Orbis, obsessed with Pipe work, the great uh, obsessed with pipe work, uh, poetry Salzburg review, and uh, the Atlanta, the, the great Atlanta review there. So uh, that's a pretty good pedigree. And uh, she says that the Newcastle Poetry School MA uh, provided a rich and rewarding focus during the months of lockdown. So thank God we were able to do that for you at, at, at the very least. Anne is working on a collection which uh, includes the voices of un named women in Hebrew scripture. This is another one of these kind of interesting things about this event, this moment of poise, where the, the, all this work in potentia is then being carried on, taken on, uh, like a little, little bit like Emma was saying there, into, the, into that first collection, that next, that next body of writing. Uh, so um, uh, would you welcome, please, at this moment of poise, Anne Simmons. Thank you, Bill. Uh, nice to be here, indeed. Yes, I've been writing a series of poems in the voice of the unnamed woman of Hebrew scripture. Um, and I'm going to offer two of them this evening and then uh, a third contrasting poem. So I'm going to offer you this evening Lot's wife, who you remember was turned into a pillar of salt. And that's followed by the voices of her daughters. Lot's wife. Herdsman's heels. Cracked like a broken pot, pressing the earth, scattering sand. This is my horizon, the hem of his robe. 
He strides, kicks back, dislodges insects skittering towards me. When he pisses, I falter, turn aside to miss the stream. It was hard when he said we should go. Leave Sodom, this lovely vale of trees by the river Jordan, myrtle and rose, it was a kind of Eden. But threats made us leave before dawn, bundles on our shoulders, wineskins full of water. Don't look back, a slap like sandals, leather on sole. I dream the drumbeat of Sodom, throb to a different music. Nights when we burnt sweet resin, smoke rose to stroke us. We squatted over perfume, pleasuring in heat. Oh, see how the sun catches the city. There's Hannah's house and Tali bathing at the well. Myra lights her cooking fire. We are going to live like bats in a cave, cold and damp in the hills of Zoa with only our goats to warm us. His heels are fierce, striking the ground, snapping the soil. Wind brings tears. I taste salt. Lot's daughters. She has stopped talking. All the way from the city, her voice babbled like water over stones. Now it has stopped. We cannot wait for her. The air is heavy with God's anger, spitting sand and stinking wind, throat burning at each breath. We long for sweet water, a soft bed, and our mother's arms. Clouds on the horizon, tall as giants, but the thunder is misplaced. It rolls beneath our feet, underground. Earth trembles and rises. God has slipped from the sky to punish us. Now rolling forward to 1960s Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. Uh, this is a poem um, about, about some time that, uh, that was spent in Sri Lanka, in Ceylon, in the 1960s, yes, and this one is called Bedroom Company. He was the first rat she ever knew. She'd led a sheltered life. But there she was at 22, sharing her room with him. He shimmied up her walls, scampered along beams, watched her in bed with black, shining eyes. A smooth operator. One night, she woke to find him on her pillow, grooming his whiskers. She didn't tell her parents. When the pole cats took up residence in the space above the rafters, Rat left without a word. That hurt. The newcomers were noisy. Kit scrabbled and quarrelled, chasing each other, disturbing her sleep. They peed through the ceiling in the corner of the room. Alarmed by the damp patch, she pretended it was rain. Thank you. Right. Uh, oh, wonderful. What a, what a fantastic detail to end on there. The pole cat's pee. Uh, great. Uh, okay, our, 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 next, our next reader tonight is, is Aaron Turner. Um, and Aaron, um, uh, I, I, I think um, maybe I've known Aaron for, 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 for longer than any of the other folk I'm introducing tonight. Um, Alan grew up in North Yorkshire and completed his MA in writing poetry after finishing his undergraduate uh, degree in English literature, hence my acquaintance with him, both at Newcastle University. During his uh, five years uh, in, at the university, Aaron has represented the university's a cappella and jazz band societies, and, and, and later he will be leading us all in a rendition of Mull of Kintyre. Um, uh, he also ran Theory Club, um, What's the first rule of theory club again, Aaron? Um, uh, which, is a, which is a society uh, in the School of English dedicated to discussing a wide range of theoretical texts. Uh, but he is now in the uh, st initial stages of becoming a detective uh, with the police force, and he is going to somehow uh, continue to write alongside that um, uh, working uh, toward uh, publication. So again, uh, would you welcome Aaron Turner? Thanks, Bill. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, the first rule I believe of theory group is that you don't speak about it, but um, 
I'm sorry I broke that rule. <laughs> um, I'm going to read three poems today, uh, two shorter ones and one longer to finish. Um, the first is also um, a Christmas sort of themed poem, uh, so a little bit appropriate for the uh, coming times. Uh, and that's called Good Samaritan. Like a person with urgent news, a parcel was waiting on the stairs when I came in. It was taped up like a secret, filled the air with mystery. I took it to my room. It was light, rustled like a rain stick. I knew it was something made of paper, so I opened it and found an old shoebox filled with wrapping and this little note. Just something small for Advent, mum. It counted a total of 24 gifts, none larger than a pocket Bible. I checked my phone for the date, December 1st. And so, imitating a child yet to be told the meaning of Christmas, I am that one. This next poem is called Crib. And um, it's about when my great grandma died and was sort of our family in sort of sharing those last moments with her. Uh, quite a harrowing experience. Uh, it's called Crib. I wonder how we must have looked, our hollow bodies circling your bed, our faceless heads popping in and out of your vignetted vision, softly talking, trying to gather your attention and faculties. Your tiny body had shrunk into itself, and when you couldn't tell us apart, you had us crying in each other's arms in the front room. I saw my red eyes in the glass cabinet. They were superimposed onto porcelain dolls. And this last poem I'm going to read is called Ode to Black Gang Chine. Um, Black Gang Chine is a, a theme park on the Isle of Wight. It's where I, I was born um, and I used to go a lot when I was younger and then every year after I'd left when I visited my grandparents. Um, it's due to the sort of the coast, there's a lot of erosion. Uh, it's, it, it's placed on the coast, so it constantly has to get moved further inland. Um, and over the years, the exhibits changed and got moved around. And so this is a poem about that. There's a lot of nouns that you won't necessarily recognize. It's clear on the page. Um, things like Smuggler's Cave, these are all exhibits. So, Ode to Black Gang China. Like any other theme park, it comes in waves, deconstructs itself, then builds back up. It dusted out the cobwebs of Smuggler's Cave, sold off the dinosaurs of the Triassic Club, and kept the famous Weather Wizard in a store. Five years ago, these attractions were uninstalled, needing the space for the underwater kingdom. UK. It's like a prophecy of what's to come. In centuries hence, the Isle of Wight will be gone, and the rest of the Isles will be in a daily mob. O oh, spirit of Black Gang Chine, would thou concede this game of chicken? You're served up on a platter, a two century strong losing streak to the sea. Instead, <laughs> let's play a game of snakes and ladders on the hillside, or dance in a musical pet shop. Let's spin around in pirate barrel teacups or pretend to shoot them up in cowboy town. Let's squeeze through the mouth of hell, slide down the plug hole, lose ourselves in fairyland. Psst, meet me in the hedge maze. I have a plan. We change the rules. Here, you Atlantis, Pompeii. At any time, you might slip into the ocean. Even the chine from whence you got your name fell a century ago to tide erosion. So, ye land of imagination, conjure us a ship to sail away in. Adieu, adieu. Leave the Hall of Mirrors behind. Don't question it. We must cast off, rebrand as Theseus, cruise ship. We'll watch the islands passing, just you and me. We'll mourn its loss, carry it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. And now we uh, have our final reader of this evening, um, uh, John White. And, and John uh, has also kind of done that strange arc 
uh, where the writing comes back to you um, uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a different way. But John was, uh, was, was first published uh, way back in um, the, the recently deceased and late lamented uh, Michael Horowitz's seminal review at New Departures, which I remember clinging to as, as, a, as a young writer, thinking maybe this will help. And uh, there, was a, there was a gap then uh, during which he worked, um, uh, you know, that old working for a living malarkey and uh, just just winning the odd BAFTA as a TV producer and uh, director. And then um, that thing uh, we, we alluded to earlier uh, where you discover the poetry school and nothing is ever the same. So he decided to be a poet again. Uh, so recently he's had several poems in the New European. Uh, he had a performance poem, I should say a rather groovy performance poem, on what he very kindly describes as that epic blog, uh, New Boots and Pandasocracies, which I, I happened to edit for, for a while. And there's a poem upcoming in the Alchemy Spoon. Uh, so if you would welcome, if you would, uh, John White. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. That's great. It's lovely to be here. Um, <clears throat> it's quite strange for all of us staring at cameras and not knowing how many of you there are out there. But I do hope you're all enjoying the evening so far. It's great, certainly for us, being part of this community, like Bill says. Um, I'm going to read three poems. And this first one is called October Sky. It's um, set in on Blackheath, which some of you all know is in South London, South East London, October sky. See the lights on Zippo's circus, roll down the big top stays, draw us across the, gra the dark grass, turn us towards the dance, towards the happy unicycle of our best hopes, careening around to applause where the spotlight plays and nothing of a dark kind pervades our hearts, not even the sad clown waiting in the shadows. Across the heath southwest, Surus streaks remind the day that it is dying, and a ring of six cranes with high cerise lights worn off freak flights of weather-watching helicopters and flying drones that peer into our lives know all about our missteps, our sad distances, the unease that frames our days and what waits when Zippo's lights go out again and doors close. Above Shooter's Hill, beyond that bright line where the big top lights cut sky, something nestles in the clouds, a meniscus fine that pulls us away from the swirling spotlight and the shaky unicycle to that cool light rising slow and glistening across the plain. Its shadows of continents and empty seas silence us, no longer alone, this October blue moon. And um, I'm going to read two poems um, from what I hope will eventually end up as a collection, uh, my take on, on memoir. The first is a sonnet about childhood loss. Leaving the garden. The red brick path outside the garden door has lost its certainty. Green trees have lost their leaves. The world is full of noisy birds who cannot hear my wail because I don't know how to cry or what to say or how to ask. She isn't there. Although I search the hornbeam trees and scan the garden's empty air, I turn around from a path grown huge with pits and holes. Back in the house, I want to trust their voices, but I cannot say my words. The room is close. The walls are grey. I hold my chair, for I am four years old, cannot breathe and cannot play, because they tell me she's on holiday. And finally, my final poem is, is from the other end of the memoir journey. It's called Love Poem 2021. Waiting for tests, the days pass, uneven, a long corridor with uncertain, darkening door. We have been around before, the long treatment, 
at first waiting while fear shakes out thin tears. But now she is older, the route less certain. He hides from dreams of loss, imagining the ground is opening up to swallow love. Leave him with a viscerated heart, grief dragging him into the earth forever. Then, illuminated in relief against this loss, he sees the journey of love stretch back. How could it be he missed this miracle, hidden in the daily grind of decisions, the blank-eyed routines of supermarket shop, or the endless resentment of washing up? How could his dull eyes miss this love? that made a space around them like a soft blue breeze in summer. He lets this journey breathe in him. The colour of this love colonises his heart. The tests are negative. This time, the tears rise up in heady joy. I'm going to live, she cries. Her body straightens, lightens, opens like a flower to the sun. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, John. Thank you for bringing it to uh, a, a, a happy note of, uh, of resolution there with that moment of release. That's great. Uh, the space around us, um, you know, even when we have this um, this, this curious um, uh, box uh, box uh, set of spaces around us, we're all get gazing at each other like weird in, in prisoners in an advent calendar um, on on our on our screen. But uh, but uh, the, the the world is is simply seeing us. Uh, one at a time, um, as we, as we, I think, uh, celebrate um, the, the the degree you're about to have. It, it's, you, you've obviously already uh, achieved your mastery um, uh, because you've created this extraordinary uh, uh, space, uh, this this circle uh, within which all of these uh, these these uh, marvelous um, uh, ideas have now found their their, uh, their their common life for just a few moments, just uh, just uh, within the within the hour. We've had the happy unicycle. We've had the pissing polecat. We've had the shifting fairground attraction. Uh, we've addressed the bee, the bees fondly. Um, uh, we, we've observed Anish Kapoor um, uh, uh, in his splendor. We've observed the Drukat sheep. Uh, we've encountered Geordie witches on possibly woolen bicycles. And of course, we have also experienced Thatcher on drugs. We all knew it was true. Um, so it only remains for me to thank you all so much for, for, your, for, your, for your readings tonight. They were, they were, they were fantastic. Um, and I will extend the thanks uh, in, in gradual ripples out to include uh, Melanie Birch for setting up this whole thing, uh, Pete Hebden for making it work, um, and uh, uh, Rachel Hewitt for giving us the space to do it in, and uh, Jake Polly, Jacob, my, my, my predecessor in the DPD role on all of those things. Uh, all the tutors uh, who've contributed um, uh, to that sense of community, uh, we've all been celebrating uh, tonight. And, and I will finish uh, by asking everyone uh, involved to take part in one last uh, act of the imagination, which is imagine yourself being deafened by applause. Uh, you can start that imagining now, and I'll wish you all a fond good night. Ah! <laughs> mm.